All righty. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is our, our first uh, webinar of the fall season, uh, Send Push Notifications Like a Pro. Uh, we're hopeful this won't be our last webinar, so uh, definitely uh, feel free to follow up with feedback uh, after today's session. So your moderators for today are myself. Uh, my name is Riley McClure. I'm our marketing lead and senior customer success coach at From Now On. Uh, and today, helping me out, I also have Sydney Reiners, who's one of our customer success coaches. She'll be moderating and, and helping to run our panel today. Hey, guys. Happy to be here and glad to see everyone was able to make it. So we have just a, a light agenda today. Uh, you know, one of the things we wanted to start off talking about are, you know, why push notifications are so valuable, why we think they're so important for getting ROI out of your mobile app. Uh, we also wanted to touch on just a, a few keys to success, observations, things we've learned uh, working with schools like yourself. Um, and uh, from there, we'll go into uh, our panelists' Q&A. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a, a few folks uh, joining us today to uh, kind of answer your questions and, and give their perspective as they have been sending notifications throughout the season. Um, and then at the end here, we'll open it up for attendee Q&A. Uh, so again, uh, if you have any questions throughout, uh, please put them into the, the Q&A uh, or into the chat. And uh, Sydney will be gathering those and uh, you know getting them to our panelists to answer. Yep. To access that Q&A in your broadcast, it's just right along the bottom right there. You can see Q&A. Um, and then also throughout the webinar, you'll also be prompted with a poll. Uh, we just got a few of them. So when you see that poll um, populate on your screen, just go ahead and click that answer and submit it, and that'll be it. So like I said, uh, we do have a few panelists joining us today. Uh, from Concordia St. Paul, we've got Josh Deere, uh, Assistant AD for Communications. Uh, we also have Blair Griffith, uh, an Athletics uh, GA for Marketing. And then we also have uh, from Rutgers University, Rob Roselli, Assistant AD for Marketing, and uh, Griffin Whitmer, uh, an Athletic Marketing Intern. So we'll revisit these guys and we'll let them say hi as we get started with our panel here in a little bit. So before we get started, I want to make one more comment. Uh, you know, since all of you have worked with us for a while, you've pro probably heard us talk about kind of our approach and you know our background. Um, kind of the mobile expertise on the team. And while it's true that you know our team, uh, including our parent company, does have over 10 years working in mobile, a lot of what we're going to talk about today really has come from the trial and error, the observation, and the uh, opportunity to work alongside schools like yourself, uh, and as you can see here on the screen. So I uh, really wanted to just kind of give a shout out and a pat on the back to those of you who made the, the time to join us today because uh, you know, our, our opportunity to present this content to you is, is built off of, you know, our, our relationship working together. So, you know, I just want to pause a moment and talk about, you know, why, why are push notifications valuable? Why do they uh, uh, bring so much value in, into driving the ROI of your mobile app? Um, so, when we look out into the market and to the kind of the industry research that, that we're, we're doing, um, we see a few things. But one is that, that push notifications, unlike any other channel, are, uh, you know, have the opportunity to be personalized. Uh, it can be a one-to-one -one or a one-to-some uh, type relationship, uh, contextual and timely. And so uh, unlike, uh, you know, an email or your website or some of the other kind of, you know, traditional uh, digital channels, uh, mobile gets in front of your audience right in the moment, um, which is just you know supremely valuable, as, as we all know, you know, from those of you that work in you know communications and marketing. Um, you know, the other thing is uh, user retention. So when we look at mobile apps, it, we're always talking about how do we grow our audience, how do we maintain our audience, and uh, what our research uh, shows us is that users who enable push notifications and who are receiving push notifications are are happier, are more engaged, uh, and are using your, your app more often. And why that, why those two first things are important uh, really comes down to one of the things that we try to help out all of our clients with, and, and that's sponsor activation. Uh, the trend we've been seeing over the last 18 to 24 months is that sponsors uh, have, have a, an appetite for uh, push notifications. It's probably one of the most, if not the most popular 
uh, inventory or, or placement that, that we've seen, um, you know, in the, in the last year or so. So, and, and the reason why it's valuable to them makes a lot of sense. It takes uh, very little effort to spend. It gets in front of a, a very targeted audience in the moment. And it takes very little effort to, for a user to not only receive that notification, but to also to engage with it. Versus an email or your website, which all require the user take, to take some type of action. A push notification is, is a much more intimate type of message. Uh, it's gonna show up on the user's device, on their lock screen, in their pocket, when they're in the car, you know, wherever. So it, it's, a, it's a much different messaging channel than some of those other uh, uh, digital opportunities. So what do we mean when we say users who have enabled push are, are more engaged? Um, so when we look at opt-in rates uh, throughout uh, mobile apps or across industries, the, the average number we're seeing these days is around 53%. And this is a, a slight uptick uh, since 2015, where it was you know, just under 50% or right around 50. And, and uh, what we're seeing and what that means is that uh, we're seeing actually a, a greater appetite from consumers for push notifications today. We're seeing a higher number of uh, consumers are reporting a, a higher threshold for how many notifications they'll tolerate before they turn notifications off. Uh, as well as a, a higher uh, tolerance for the frequency and volume of push notifications before they will uh, even remove an app entirely. Um, and so that doesn't mean that you know, you've got carte blanche to send as many notifications as you want, but it does mean that you have a little bit more flexibility to experiment uh, and to get the right message out to your audience. Um, and so when we look at users that do have push uh, enabled, what we see is uh, that they have a higher number of app launches in any given reporting period, which means they're actively seeking out the app and, and opening it up um, for the first time more often. And then once they've got it open, uh, they are contributing a higher number of app sessions um, in any given reporting period. And I, and I think the stat is actually it's like three or four times the number of sessions that a user is contributing who doesn't have push enabled. Finally, uh, you know, when we look at retention rates, uh, building a, a mobile app audience is all about not only maintaining your audience, but also continuing to grow that audience. Um, and users who are push enabled, uh, when we look at industry benchmarks like 30 day retention and 90 day retention are uh, keeping that app on, app on their phone after that person installed far longer than those users who don't. Um, and there's kind of an industry stat that's out there that says that a user who receives a push notification within the first seven days of downloading that app uh, will, you know, has a far greater likelihood of still being a user in a year's time compared to, to a user that does. So an active push notification strategy is really important to maintaining, not only maintaining your audience, but maintaining an engaged audience. And so some of the things that we want to talk about today are observations, things that we've seen have made schools successful. Um, some things to watch out for, and then, like I said, we'll get into our panel and they can relate uh, what some of their experiences have been. So our first uh, key to success for today, um, really is keep it simple. Uh, so you can see here, uh, some of the examples we have are um, all about, you know, finding ways, finding uh, opportunities to send a notification in line with things you're already doing. So, for example, if you've got a weekly coaches show, uh, you're already promoting that, you're already pushing that out across other channels. It's a perfect opportunity to, you know, right at the start of the event or an hour before the event, uh, push out a notification to your football subscribers and say, hey, uh, the, you know, Coach's Show is about to start. Uh, come into the app to, to find out how to listen to it. Um, you know, certainly working in college athletics and, and working around uh, athletic events, uh, you're going to want to always uh, have an emergency notification procedure. And so something like a, a weather delay update is gonna be uh, important um, to, to get out to your fans if you're communicating to them about you know, where to go during uh, severe weather when it strikes or letting fans know who maybe are at home, uh, hey, when is this, this delay gonna be over or even that the game is delayed. So sometimes that information can be hard to find. So uh, a notification uh, is, a, is a really good opportunity there as well. 
And then, you know, also standard things like, uh, you know, do you have a conference weekly award or, you know, just general game reminders that, that can provide some value to the users. And what we've heard from schools a, a lot of times is that, uh, you know, resources are, are a challenge, whether it's uh, time or, or staffing. And so what we always encourage uh, schools in those situations to do is look at your game scripts, look at your game calendars. Uh, find opportunities that are easy, that can be scheduled out, you know, in the example of the coaches show, scheduled out for the whole season, do it once, it's done. Um, things like that just to get started and to get your audience used to the kind of content they're going to get. And then from there, you start to build and evolve your strategy into what are some more unique content opportunities we can find. And, uh, you know, just as a, an FYI, we do have a poll live, uh, you know, we're interested in what you're doing with push notifications today. Uh, so definitely fill that out uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, and uh, we'll, we'll look at the results a little bit later. So our second key to success, uh, show some personality. Uh, mobile is fun. Uh, we, we believe it's fun, and we believe it should be fun. Uh, so it's okay to experiment and find ways to, to show some style, uh, you know, as long as it's, um, you know, uh, on brand or in line with, you know, you know, the voice of your brand or the style of your brand uh, as it appears on other channels. But, you know, you, you can feel free to have fun. And, you know, I think there's a couple of great examples here. Uh, Rutgers, uh, just a few weeks ago with their uh, kind of mock presidential alert message, this came out the day that, that that presidential notification that I think we all got on, their, on our phones, this came out minutes after that went out. So it was timely, it was relevant to what users were seeing, and what makes it great is that it's kind of light, it's kind of fun, and it actually directs to an action that they wanted their fans to take, wear black to the game on, on Saturday. Um, so it really checks all the boxes of what we look for in a, a valuable push notification. Uh, another great example here, and, and really creative use of, I think, emoji and, and you know, the uh, text that you have in a notification is uh, right. And what you can see that's unique here that they did is, you know, even just like the simplicity of spacing out like the word champion adds a little bit more impact, adds a little bit more effect, eye-catching to the user. So as they're scrolling through their notifications that they're receiving, they're going to see the emoji, they're going to see that, that that looks a little different than everything else they're getting. Um, and then they're gonna, it's gonna give them an opportunity to engage. And then selfishly, and, and Sydney will probably make fun of me here, uh, I am a big uh, Juventus uh, soccer fan. They're playing in the Champions League today, so I pulled in an example from their app, who is uh, just, they're not a client of ours, but I think it's, a, it's a, another great example of knowing your audience and showing some style. And unlike a lot of, uh, I guess, communication channels out there, uh, you can be kind of silly and, and fun uh, on mobile if you want to use, you know, all caps, if you want to use a lot of exclamation marks. Um, you know, within reason, you know, feel free to experiment with that. Use them well. And so what they do, if you, you know, uh, were to follow their app, these are the types of notifications they send all game. Um, they all have kind of a little fun phrase. Uh, they all, you know, are celebratory and like this kind of a moment for a, you know, for a big goal. Um, so it's... Uh, it's really about kind of picking picking your moment, uh, picking the opportunity to to show a little bit of that style, and then doing it in a way that's gonna you know resonate with your audience and what they're looking for. So our our final uh, or our next key to success is about creating value, and really what we're looking for here is you know as you evolve your notification strategy, you've experimented a little bit with. Uh, you know, the basic, uh, basics of reminder messages and things like that. Maybe you start to use some emoji or uh, put a little brand style into your, into your content. You know, the, the next step that we see is really how do you find some unique, exclusive content opportunities to engage your audience? Um, so, the, you know, the examples here I think are really great. Uh, Illinois State had a, uh, a senior, I believe it was a volleyball player, up for the senior class award as a finalist push out this uh, notification. And what's uh, unique here that I unfortunately can't show in this context is that users who opened this notification actually got what we call springboarded to an external URL. So they got, users who opened it actually got taken directly to the page where they could vote for this award. So 
you know, for a fan who's engaged in, in following that team, that's a fun opportunity to uh, kind of show some pride, contribute, uh, but it also says, wow, you know, this is, there's going to be some unique opportunities to engage with this app. I need to continue keeping it on my phone. Um, you know, also fun things, like we've got an example from Western Michigan here for a, a, a contest to win concert tickets. Um, that's a great opportunity, something you can drop into a promotion. Uh, it really is a, a good example of uh, what action do you want the user to take and then, you know, making sure that you have the right content to kind of back it up that, that's going to be valuable to your, your fans. And then, and then probably one of my favorites is, and a really great example of uh, a sponsor activation is uh, Florida State. Uh, weekly they do this Garnet and Gold Grub, uh, where they actually drop a, a new unique recipe every week in, into their mobile app just using our promotion functionality. And that's actually a sponsor activation for them. So you can see this is presented by Tico People's Gas. There's some opportunity in the uh, promotion itself for uh, for some logo placement and some, some you know, kind of brand messaging. I believe there's also a, a kind of a, a URL to drive out to. Um, and this is what we want to see when we see sponsor activation in the app. Because what this to a fan is, uh, this is a sponsor that's aligned with the brand and that's presenting something that's valuable to the fan. This isn't a direct advertisement. This isn't, uh, hey, come to Foot Locker and get 20% off which you would be surprised to get from, you know, a Florida State app uh, in that example. So, you know, there are some guidelines around how to do sponsored uh, content and advertising type content uh, around uh, notifications specifically put out kind of by Apple. So those guidelines are always something that we're looking at. Um, and if you ever have a question about it, uh, you know, our suggestion is to reach out to your customer success coach and we can kind of advise you of what's in line and what's not. Um, but stuff like this is, is perfect, and you know I know we also have a lot of schools who do sponsored game alerts, things like that are great. Um, so you know keep doing that and uh, continue to, to ask us for, for recommendations. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, talk about uh, what are some of the things that we want to watch out for as we're building a push notification strategy. Uh, we definitely don't want you to be penalized uh, by your fans uh, by having them turn off their notifications or to delete the app entirely. And the first of those, uh, and maybe the most important one, uh, is brevity. Um, none of us, you know, a lot of us, I think, have, have backgrounds in marketing and communication, uh, but we're also consumers, and, you know, no one likes to read a wall of text. So our, our guideline or our recommendation there is when you're sending a push notification, um, Try to limit, at the most, we really like to see about four lines of text. Um, you know, there's going to be a, there's going to be opportunities where, where you need to go over. Um, we, we get that, but it shouldn't be an everyday type thing. Um, and, and what the data tells us is actually that the most effective uh, notifications are those that are, are the, the shortest. Um, so, so be mindful of that. Um, and really kind of the sweet spot that we look for is about two lines, two to three lines of text, two lines of text, about 100 characters. Um, and again, if you ever want uh, us to play an editorial role for you or to consult or provide some guidance, you can always reach out to your customer success coach uh, who can kind of help you with uh, composing those. The, uh, <laughs> our, next, uh, our next key to success you know, is all around uh, frequency and kind of being uh, self-aware of uh, how you're sending content out to your fans. Um, and really the, the message here is, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want your app to be seen as that nosy neighbor that's dropping in all the time onto the lock screen, onto their phone. Uh, so be mindful of how often you're sending messages. Uh, our recommendation is to limit to a handful a week. I know a lot of people are sending a lot of notifications around game day, uh, so please just be mindful if you're doing that. This is a great opportunity to uh, use segmentation to limit to specific audience, like just students or just season ticket holders um, of a particular sport, or to use our, our geofencing capabilities to send just what's relevant to, say, people that are at the game, uh, for example. And then, you know, our, our final uh, key to success here is, is kind of on that same theme of 
of being self-aware um, and the context that you're sending a notification. So consider the consider the context, consider the timing of when you shoot a notification out. And you know, a great example that we ran into this season, which was uh, frankly new to us, is we had a school who had a pregame audio show for football that was a, a longer uh, uh, pregame broadcast show. So what happened was when they had an 11 a.m. game time, uh, that scheduled notification for that pregame broadcast uh, would normally have been scheduled to go out at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And I, I don't know about any of you, but uh, I, if I get woken up by my kids at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning, uh, I guess I'll allow that. But if, uh, if I'm woken up by a notification, I might be a little salty. So uh, what we did we, in that situation, we actually consulted with the school. We ran through two or three options. We said, should we send a reminder Friday night? Should we just send no reminder? Should we send, send one you know, uh, later in the broadcast? And I think ultimately what we did is we shot it out at like 8 or 9 a.m. that morning um, uh, to, to those fans. So that, that's kind of what we have uh, for, uh, for our keys to success. What we're gonna do now is Sydney's gonna go ahead and drop another poll. Hopefully some of this content has been helpful for you and you're ready to, to get after it this weekend and, and shoot out some push notifications. Um, whoops. Uh, we are also, let's go on here. We are also going to now uh, turn on the audio and introduce our panelists. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, just kind of go around again and introduce these guys. So we've got Josh Deere uh, from Concordia St. Paul uh, and Blair Griffith uh, from Concordia St. Paul. Rob Roselli from Rutgers, and uh, Griffin Whitmer, uh, also from Rutgers. So guys, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, unmute your audio now. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. All yes. right. So we are now, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sydney, and she is actually going to uh, kind of run the show here and uh, ask our, our first question. We've got just a few questions, and then we will start taking uh, your questions uh, from the chat. All right. So the first one here, and uh, for our attendees, if you guys have follow-up questions based off of the conversation that comes during this panelist Q&A, go ahead and drop them into that Q&A by just clicking that button down at the bottom of your screen, um, and I'll address them as they come up. Um, or, you know, I'll mention saying, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this once we get to the open attendee Q&A. Uh, so we're going to open it up here with the, just a chance for our panelists here to give us some background on uh, their usage for push. So just describing the importance you place on push notification usage uh, with your game day app. And I will actually have our guys from Concordia St. Paul kick it off here. So Josh and uh, Blair, if you want to go ahead and pipe in. Yeah, thanks, Sydney. Um, this is Josh. Uh, th I think the, the easy answer for this one is it's the reason why we have this app. Um, our goal with with getting a game day fan app was to engage directly with our primarily our students but really any of our stakeholders that follow us and are interested in our athletic department um, this came about through a conversation that we had with a couple of student interns last year and we were asking them why they weren't at a particular game in the fall season um, and what we can do to, to kind of spark some of the, uh, them and some of their friends to come. And they said, tell us directly, uh, send us an email. And on our campus, we cannot send uh, mass emails to our students. So we started looking into uh, how we wanted to communicate directly with them. That's how we ended up finding From Now On. And um, so our number one goal with the app is to send out um, push notifications to get into our students' pockets. And Blair is doing a great job of um, directly engaging them. And Blair, if you want to just describe a little bit more on what you're doing with that. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, we kind of try to do our best to do a lot of our student reward stuff through our app. Um, being a relatively small institution, I think it's been beneficial for us to push out notifications and really be in people's pockets. And I think we've seen um, attendance increase for sure over the course of our fall sports. Um, then I'll also considering kind of that answer 
activation stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there is stuff out there. Yep. Well, I don't know if they do, but other people. All right, thank you guys. Um, Rob, uh, Griffin, can you expand upon kind of Rutgers' approach to push? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, this is Rob Roselli from Rutgers. It's interesting, you know, to hear to hear those guys talk about it. For us, push notifications. Ironically enough, we don't really focus on students. Um, we tend to use Snapchat and Instagram uh, to reach our students. For us, we kind of view push notifications as twofold. Um, one, game day. So for us on game day, whether it's a football game day, a basketball game day, whatever it may be. For us, it becomes a complimentary messaging tool. So essentially a screen that people are going to be looking at throughout the day, whether they're out at the tailgate or making their way over to the stadium. Um, so for us on game day, it really is a complimentary messaging tool. We're, we're kind of accepting of the fact that folks that are at the game probably aren't going to be looking at our Twitter throughout the day or checking our Facebook page throughout the day, but they are going to be glancing at their phone to see what time it is, to see if they're getting texts. So for us, that prime real estate on the home screen becomes really important um, to be able to reach folks that are on site on game day. Um, and then beyond game day, I think we, we try to answer the question anytime before we send a push um, to Riley's point in the, in the beginning, is this timely and is it relevant? Um, we don't wanna make people angry with our push notifications. We don't wanna overdo it. We wanna make sure that anytime we take it upon ourselves to push something to that prime real estate, that we're a respectful of that real estate, knowing that if we overdo it, it's easy to tune us out. Um, and that B, it comes at, it comes at the right time and is valuable to them. Um, so really for us by segmenting it as to game day notifications and then non game day, that's kind of where we at the, at a high level, um, decipher between what we're going to do. Um, Griff, anything to add to that in terms of how we use the push notifications on game day? Yeah. It, it also kind of helps us, just to keep our fans informed and, you know, it affords us the opportunity to update them if things change, you know, in our first game of the season, you know, a lot of fans seem to be having trouble with the bag policy and getting stopped at the gates because their bags weren't allowed in. So this allowed us the next week to create a push that we sent out, you know, in the morning during tailgating time. And we would have that, you know, when you open the push, it would bring you right to our game day bag policy. So this way we can make sure that, you know, the fans were informed and that, you know, the, this mistake, I guess, wouldn't happen again. So it also, it's a great option for us to keep them informed and engaged on new things happening. Awesome. Um, thank you, guys. And we've got a question here from John, um, and we'll actually touch on this in uh, one of our upcoming slides here. So we'll, we'll step on to the next question here. Uh, number two, uh, what is your approach to planning push notifications? And I'll, I'll I'll let the Rutgers guys continue to hold the floor here. And um, John, just a heads up, we'll, we'll get to that question here shortly. So um, Rob, if you want to take back over or Griffin. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of how we approach the planning of notifications, I'll just speak from a, a football game day standpoint, because that's what we've been doing the most of recently. Obviously, as we get into winter sports, it'll change a little bit, but Really what I'll do throughout the week is as the marketing contact for football, I'm putting together the game day script. I'm putting together the festivities that are taking place both inside and outside the stadium. Um, and then myself and Griff will sit down on a Thursday or on a Friday and we'll go through that sheet of activities um, and we'll try to identify things that we think make sense to utilize a push notification for. Now we do have things that are very standard. We tend to always, send one that says the band show, marching band show starts soon, make sure you make your way into the stadium. Things like that were pretty consistent. Um, things like gates are now open. But to Griff's point, we're also reacting, right? We wanna be aware of what our customers are telling us. And after game one, you know, we heard a lot, like Griff said about the bag policy. So that allowed us to say, well, wait a minute, push notification, probably a good tool to use on game day um, to alert people of what kind of bag they can bring in the stadium, what kind of bag they can't. Um, so you can do a lot of planning, and I think we're pretty good at that here, at, at sitting down and coming together, coming up with a list of things. But you also need to be flexible, right? You don't want to send the same six push notifications every football Saturday or every basketball home game because, again, back to that original point that I made, then it's easy for people to tune you out. If they know every game they're going to get the same six notifications and it's the same information, 
then it becomes less valuable to them. So yes, planning is important. And I think we were pretty thorough in that process. Like I said, we go through a game day activity sheet um, to understand, you know, what makes sense to push. But then as a, as a follow-up to that, we're aware of what our fans are asking for. We try to monitor consumer behavior, customer behavior, and, and use pushes to, to drive them to an action. Griff, anything to add to that? Yeah, just building off that, you know, before the season started, we looked at our game day script and we were able to identify probably three or four things that we thought we would need to have as push notifications every single week. But that also gives us flexibility because, you know, if our game is at noon, we're ha we have a schedule of push notifications starting at about 930. So we can have our couple of main pushes, but then each week this allows us, you know, after week one, we worked in the bag notification into our weekly schedule. But when we have different things, you know, such as our blackout game, we decided to do something different where, you know, we sent a push notification instead of just to people in the stadium, we sent one early in the morning, I think at about 8 a.m. to everyone on the app, reminding them to wear black just as kind of a way, you know, we wanted to make sure people at home before they leave to come to the stadium would see this notification and remember to wear black. So having, you know, you know, a couple of set notifications still gives us flexibility when we have new promotions or new things that we want to tell fans, we're able to add that in still without going overboard and creating too many notifications. Awesome. Great. Thank you guys. Um, and then I'm going to um, beep up over here to Concordia St. Paul and kind of have you guys um, talk a little bit about how you guys approach. And then also we'll kind of combine this question along with one that we um, had segmented later on, but as you talk about planning your push notifications and, you know, if you're planning the week ahead for, for a football game, you know, if you want to just expand upon how you segment those. So, you know, what, who are you sending that notification for? So um, Josh and Blair, if you want to kind of describe your guys's approach for, for a weekend or something like that, and then also just share in your answer, you know, who, who are you sending that to? Is it the event followers or are you further segmenting down? Um, I'll let you guys take that away. Sure. Uh, I mean, we, we operate similarly to what they're doing over at Rutgers. I'd say, you know, we try to get an outlook on the week as far as games and promotional stuff go. Um, something that we do consistently is we draft one hour notifications prior to every home game just to kind of make people aware uh, that there's a game coming up, what time it's going to start at, um, just to try to kind of increase last minute attendance. Um, but we do take into consideration kind of the event. Um, an opportunity to get students there if it's kind of a big or relatively more important game. Um, I may draft a few um, notifications throughout the week. Um, obviously not trying to overwhelm the followers, but I'll draft just a couple more to kind of gauge um, more interest in the game. Um, and then kind of how we incorporate our, our promotional stuff. Like I kind of mentioned earlier, we do some of our student reward stuff through the app. So if we have one of our corporate partners um, coming in and we have um, some giveaways or uh, things like that. Uh, we make sure to send out separate notifications to students, kind of segmented that way. You know, come out today to, to watch your Golden Bears play and have an opportunity to, to receive, you know, whatever it may be for that game. Um, so we do try to kind of segment it that way and make it specific to different, different audiences. Um, but, I mean, we, we operate similarly. We just kind of try to gauge how – um, you know, what we are anticipating for the game um, and things like that. So, um, but as you mentioned, we don't want to overwhelm followers. Um, so we don't try to push out too many notifications, but yeah. One, uh, one thing that we've, we have a kind of a unique deal here is Blair handles our marketing and he's really plugged in. He was first a student athlete here just a few years ago, finished his college football career as one of the student coaches. And now he is a graduate assistant, so he has sort of um, eased up the ladder in terms of responsibility and leadership on, on campus, yet he still maintained a lot of positive relationships with some of the upperclassmen and student athletes that we have. And since that's a core constituent of who we're trying to reach, he's really able to gauge the pulse of what is working and what's not working and what they're liking and what they're ignoring. And, um, and if he's feeling like he's either over um, – of blasting too much, I guess, um, like Kramer or 
if, if we're being effective. And um, I think that's important to, to find a way to um, figure out how you're being successful. And it's really not everyone's going to have somebody like we have with Blair, who is as plugged into the student body as he is, or, you know, if Rutgers is trying to reach a different group of constituents, just finding, finding a way to, to hear back from them and, and figure out what's working. Great. Thank you guys. Um, and we're going to skip past this third question since you guys have been very thorough in your answers um, and kind of already addressed that piece. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, jump onto this question four. And this is just how do you spice up your notifications? You know, what are you guys doing and what's kind of your plan so that when that notification shows up on a user phone that, you know, they might glance at it and look away, but whatever you did to spice it up um, brings those eyes back over to the phone. Um, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll take it back over to our guys at Rutgers if you want to um, take a stab at this one first. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question, whether it's on push notifications or within the app itself or even on social media. A question we always have, always have to ask ourselves is how are we going to use, make sure our tone and our voice come through. Um, so for us, I mean, it's funny, well, you know, if you want us to get granular about it, I'll literally sit here with Griff on a Thursday or on a Friday and we'll have imoji.com pulled up and we'll be looking at it. And as we build our push notifications, we'll be trying to see where does it make sense to use an emoji. Um, it sounds silly to say that we sit there and have that discussion, but I think it's important because to your point, um, you, in, with a push notification, I look at it almost as like a billboard. You only have six seconds or so, five seconds or so that somebody's going to glance at it. Traditionally, they'll get the push, glance at their phone, and that'll pretty much be the end of it. Now, in that four or five seconds, six seconds, you do have the chance to, to inspire some call to action. Um, and little things like voice, all caps, uh, adding the right emoji, even a hashtag occasionally um, can add a different dynamic to a push where it becomes different than your traditional just a sentence or two of information. Um, so for us, emojis, whether it's on, on within the app or within on social media as well, they're huge. And I think the, the important thing to note there is while we do try to have fun and get creative, we don't want to go rogue, right, to the Kramer point. We don't want to just randomly throw an emoji in there just for the heck of it. Um, so we want it to be on brand. So when it makes sense, you know, with us being the Scarlet Knights, we'll try to throw in a sword emoji or, uh, or a shield emoji or those types of things that make sense. Um, but I think what you'll find is as you build push notifications, just naturally based on what the content tends to be, whether it's about parking or concessions, there are plenty of emojis that help tell that story. And I think uh, the last thing I'd add on that note is, they give you the opportunity to, to not include as much text, right? So instead of having to use the word parking or car, um, or have to use the word hamburger, we have the option to use a little piece of text that tells that story through one character. So very important for, for, for our purposes. Griff, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, that's, that's basically it. I think something that, you know, maybe we even subconsciously do is try our best to do anything but a basic push with just, you know, the title of the push and then the actual push. Uh, we've experimented with uh, emojis in the text, emojis in the title of the push, changing, you know, the format and all that. It's basically just anything where, you know, when someone glances at their phone and looks at this push notification, there's something there that's gonna, you know, maybe keep, the, keep their eyes on their phone for an extra second. And even if it's just that, that may cause them to decide to, you know, engage and open the app from that push if it's anything more than just basic. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Blair, I know you're the, the main uh, creator of those push notifications. Can you provide a little bit of information about how you like to spice up the notifications you all send at Concordia? Sure. Um, I mean, through feedback we've gotten, people do generally like just the more basic general notifications at times, just so they're kind of aware of what's going on. But um, when there are games that we want to emphasize or we want increased attendance or we have a neat promotion we're doing or a corporate partner coming in and doing something um, more exciting, we absolutely try to add all caps as best as we can or um, as many exclamation points. I haven't taken advantage of emojis quite yet, but I probably will moving forward. But um, absolutely using all caps and exclamation marks, um, try to draw more attention that way has been, has been effective for us. 
Awesome. Anything to add, Josh? Um, the only thing I have to add is one thing I like to do is use asterisks be, um, to emphasize something um, in addition to in all caps, throw a couple before and after a word to um, really draw attention to that. But other than that, these guys really um, explained it well. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so we're going to get in, kind of open it up to everyone here in the audience. And I know um, we got a little bit of a touch on the answer for the question that John brought to our attention, but we'll just um, more finely tune and um, address that here. So um, John from Moorhead has the question, do you ever send multi-sport push notifications to promote a weekend, or do you always go sport specific? So when you're sending out that notification about, you know, the football game, are you just sending it to those followers, or are you sending it to all users? Um, multi-sport, um, and I'll let uh, Josh start off here, and then Rob, I'll let you guys take over after we've got that answer. I don't think we've ever targeted multi-sport. We a haven't tried. B can you? Uh, so you can do. Uh, yep. So the the answer there is you can select to send it to all users, um, or you know, in this question, you can uh, send it to those football followers, or you can further segment it down to I am a football follower and I'm only you know I'm a student. So it's only going to go to student users who are following football. Uh, so sorry, I think that was a little confusing in how I, I read that and reworded it. But I guess the question is, um, do you ever send notifications to all users? And in that case, you know, is it for events like a football game or is it something different? Or do you send uh, notifications to all users? I can elaborate on that a little bit. Um, kind of what I've done is have just sent um, to individual teams um, and individual team followers. Um, the only time that I've ever tried to promote another event with, for example, football followers was during our homecoming weekend. Um, I sent out a notification during our homecoming football game. Um, oh, now go uh, head over to our Gangahoff Center and uh, try to support the volleyball team. Um, so if it's kind of, if, if we know that we have a lot of people in a location um, or a lot of people following a specific game, um, I may do that but very sparingly if, if, I, if I do try to push those out. Awesome. Robin Griffin? For us, in order to send a push to all users, it really has to be of high value. So the two examples that come to mind, the presidential alert we actually sent uh, to our entire database. I think with that one, we can be candid about it. We were trying to get a little bit of publicity and make a splash about it. So. We figured the more folks we sent it to, the better in order to get some eyeballs on it. Um, and then another example that comes to mind, I was actually working with Riley and Clayton yesterday just to make sure everything was, was shored up. But we sent a push to our entire database um, via a promotion. Um, yesterday was one year out from the 150th anniversary of college football. Um, and obviously with the game being born here when Rutgers beat Princeton, um, it's a big year for us. So yesterday we unveiled some branding, some logos, some plans about the anniversary. Um, so we used the push uh, to send it to all users. Could we have sent that to football only? Yes, and we thought about that. But for us, it, it was such a big thing that we, we figured it made sense to send it to an entire audience. Um, and the beauty of the one we did yesterday was it wasn't just a swipe through to read something in the app. We actually used the swipe through um, to do what's called an external springboard URL, um, which allows us to, when someone swipes through the push, they actually get redirected. So if you got our push yesterday and swiped through, it actually took you right into Twitter, assuming you had the Twitter app um, to the Rutgers football Twitter profile. So we're very selective about when we do an all, all user one. Those are really the only two examples I can think of within the last three or six months. Um, and then on game day, I think just the, the geofencing is the feature we probably utilize the most. That idea that if we're going to push people within the area, it's got to be something that makes sense to them being there. And we're not going to bother people that aren't on site um, with that kind of messaging. Yeah. Um, you know, one more that I can think of, I think we've only ever done three, is for our blackout game. I had mentioned it earlier. We sent one out in the morning just to try to, you know, I guess there's no way to to know which users are going to the game. So we definitely took a risk with that one. Uh, we just wanted to make sure, you know, anyone who was going to the game would just get a reminder to wear black. Um, 
And, you know, it was risky because we, I guess, three days before that was the day that we sent a presidential alert. Um, but it's basically just when we feel it's an absolute necessity. And we were really trying to push that blackout game hard. And I think those two were, were good pushes. And, you know, we didn't really get any negative feedback. But, again, like Rob said, it's a pretty rare occurrence. But I feel like when we've done it, it's been necessary and effective. Great. Thank you, guys. And I know you guys touched on uh, using the geofence, the in-arena notification. Um, I want to get an answer from that as well from our guys at Concordia. Do you guys utilize the in-arena notifications? And if so, you know, where, where is the value you place on that in addition to, you know, those um, other um, game day notifications? Sure. So that kind of goes back into uh, the weekly planning of, of games. Um, in the future, so if I, you know, speak with a uh, sponsor about um, doing some type of in-game promotion for them, and where they can go into the app and s select their own personal card, um, and we, you know, we try to utilize that in-game geofence, so I can push out notification and say, "Hey, come to the game today and have an opportunity to win some Buffalo Wild Wings rewards or whatever it may be." And then if they come to the game, we can utilize the geofence. Um, and since they're in the location, they'll get an automatic card dropped into their app. So that allows us to incentivize students and fans to come to the game, but it also allows us to do some creative things with some of our partners. So um, that's how we've utilized geofencing thus far in that capacity. Thank you, Blair. Uh, we've got another question here from the audience uh, with John. Uh, what do you push outside of game day that has high value? Um, and Blair, I'll go ahead and let you take back over with this question, um, and then we'll we'll kick it over to Rutgers after you. Um, I think, you know, we go back to planning out what we want to do um, in the upcoming week. Um, the notifications that seem to have higher value are the ones that are incentivized to our students in specific. Um, you know, kind of just speaking on big games that are upcoming. Um, you know, I haven't really been utilizing this the way I want to, but I think moving forward, I'm planning on um, doing neat recognition of individual athlete accomplishments as well. Um, I think that would actually have high value and keep people kind of engaged in the app that way as well. So moving forward, we're probably going to um, do that more often. But yeah, I think just the incentivized stuff, um, letting people know what, what's, what's coming, things that they can get, giveaways, things like that. Um, have have been very beneficial so thank you um rob for you guys yeah i think it's a great question um and we have a lot of conversations uh even within our marketing cubicle here before any kind of non-game day push notification gets sent out and that conversation tends to revolve around is this timely is this relevant is this of value to someone um, will someone find this information valuable or will they say hey you know that was kind of annoying I could have read that on Twitter so um, for us I think the distinguishing factor is informational versus promotional if it's informational I, I, we tend to not utilize and again we're only talking non game day here um, for us on non game days informational we don't really do a whole lot of um, it has to kind of fall under that category of promotional, something that we're truly trying to promote. Um, so the example that I, that I talked about with the 150th anniversary, that's a good example of one. Um, wearing black to the game, that's a good example of one. We actually wanted people to take an action from the push. If during the week we, get, we hear that you know, a basketball player got named Big Ten Player of the Week, um, there's really no call to action. The only, the only purpose of a push with something like that would be awareness. And just our general philosophy is something like that can live on Facebook, on Twitter, within an email newsletter. Um, so really promotional and call to action are kind of those two distinguishing factors that help us decide if something on a non-game day is worth pushing. Thanks, Rob. Um, I want to open the floor up. I know we've uh, just got a few questions in here, but if anything comes to mind for any of our attendees out there in the audience, you know, uh, there is no question that's silly or unwarranted. So uh, definitely flood the channel. And obviously, if you have questions um, after the webinar, don't hesitate to reach out to your personal CSC. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys to pop those questions into the channel. Um, otherwise, 
we'll, we'll move on to the second one here for you guys. Um, and that would just be, you know, do you guys have a, a set character count that you try to keep a notification to, uh, you know, trying to keep it to two lines or a specific number? Uh, what do you say that is? I'll let uh, Griffin take over and Rob. Yeah, um, you know, when we create the pushes in the software, there's actually, I'm not sure what, I think it might be 100 characters is the limit. So once we get to 100 characters, it'll stop us. And usually we don't get that far, but I think if we ever do, it's, it's a good reminder that what we were trying to write out was probably too much. Uh, we do, you know, as Rob said, Friday mornings, we sit down and we'll plan out our game day push notifications. And I think one of our goals is we take, we have a Google doc where we'll plan out all the notifications, write out what we want them to be but it won't necessarily just be a copy and paste. We'll take the push that we have the idea of and we try to make it as compact, but as effective as possible. We don't want to make these a nuisance. You know, we want to, we want them to be concise and to the point and effective. So that's definitely something that we're cognizant of every single time we make a push is how do we convey as much information in as few characters as possible. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Blair, I don't know if you have anything to expand upon on that note or um, anything to add there. Um, yeah, we're kind of in line with that. Um, like, he, like Griffin mentioned, there's, um, as far as I know, when I'm drafting this stuff, there is a 100 character limit. So if I'm getting close to that, I kind of know to stop or try to make it more compact and more informational that way. So we kind of follow in line with that as well. Great, thank you guys. <clears throat> all right, next question. And I know this is definitely helpful for, for all our clients out there just to kind of get an idea of uh, every school is a different size, has a different staff makeup. Um, but for you guys, you know, I know we've kind of already mentioned it, but you know, who composes or sends those notifications for your school? Um, a staff member or do you allow interns? I know you guys have kind of talked about your game plans there, but just to um, kind of finite that, um, Josh, do you want to kind of expand upon, you know, maybe Blair's role or what led you guys to deciding who was sending those notifications? Sure. So at Concordia, we view this tool um, two different ways. One is from sports information and game day um, live notifications or more reactive where we're sending out notifications on sports that don't have live stats like cross country or golf where we'll type in a notification. Um, that comes out of the SID office and a lot of the more proactive messaging that we do is coming from our marketing where we're trying to get people to come to games. Um, so my staff is a group of four SIDs and then um, Blair is our, is our marketing graduate assistant and he has a team of interns. So pretty much, uh, this has already been mentioned on, on the webinar already, but having your university's voice is important. And so far we have done a good job of staying consistent with that across all of the people that have access to sending messages out. Um, and I think that's because we all are users of the app and we're all aware of what each other are doing. Um, and like the guys um, with Rutgers have been saying, it's intentional. So we're sitting down and we're chatting about it and making a battle plan. Um, Blair, do you want to um, expand on if you, if any of your team of interns has any access to do it as well? Um, yeah, uh, the interns that I, I have had a few interns um, help me out with some of that and assist in, in drafting some of those things. Um, the more mature ones are the ones that can easily put thoughts together and um, be intentional about what we want to put out there. Um, so yeah, I try to involve them as much as possible and um, kind of from a promotional standpoint and the timing standpoint of when we want to push out notifications, they, I do have my interns help me out um, in that capacity for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Blair. Um, and I just want to make sure that we get all these uh, questions in before we call time. And I know we've got one more poll we want to drop before we finish up here. Uh, so just briefly, this is our, our last call for questions from the audience. I know we've got one more that we want to get in here, but first I'll let Robin Griffin just kind of uh, touch on this question that we're answering right now about who composes and sends notifications. So go ahead, Rob. Sure. For us, I think it's, it's, I'll be honest, it's not an ideal workflow. I think in a perfect world, 
and eventually this will be the case in a perfect world we'll have a digital team of three to four folks that handle you know this type of thing but just the reality of it right now is that it lives within marketing um, our communications folks handle the game updates which as we know you know are linked to stat crew and coming out um, throughout a game so in terms of workflow again it comes back to that planning process griff really leads that charge um, for, for our staff um, it, i think it was a good example of when an intern shows you know interest and shows skill in certain areas that it makes sense to give someone responsibilities and not tasks um, so for us this became a responsibility for griff and it wasn't just a, a one-off it became hey there's seven home saturdays you know, you tell me your best suggestions as to how we're going to utilize push notifications. So it's that weekly planning that's done by Griff, which I'll let him touch on. And it's that Thursday or Friday sit down where we kind of run through things. We compare what he's drafted to what I had in mind. Um, but at the end of the day, he's the one that types it in and presses send. Um, so Griff, anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, it kind of started over the summer. Uh, Rob just, Rob and I went over uh, literally what the, the game sheet was. And he asked me to pick out what events on that sheet I thought would be important to use as push notifications. And then, you know, we drafted up a Google doc of, I think six or seven pushes. And it kind of just snowballed from there. Friday mornings before home games, I'd go in and we would go over them. And then, you know, now that we're in a flow, all preset you know, a list of pushes, but, you know, knowing that Fridays we're going to be sending these, I'm cognizant of new promotions of, you know, I'm constantly thinking of new ideas that we can implement as pushes just so, you know, we're not sending out the same pushes every week that we can have a variety and they can be effective. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, and we did just drop that poll here. This is just for us to gauge, you know, what, what is most important to you guys as we plan out our webinars moving forward. Uh, so definitely, I know we've got one more question that we're going to uh, ask our panelists here. Uh, but if you, you know, before you jump out of this webinar, uh, please take time to answer that question. You know, what, what do you want us to cover in our next webinar that we have coming up? Uh, so our final question here, and I'll let our guys at Rutgers um, take this one first. Uh, anything, um, are you guys doing anything around sponsored notifications? And then when you do sponsored notifications, are you concerned at all with crossing that authenticity line with your fans? That's a great question. We do, uh, so we have IMG as our corporate sponsorship team here at Rutgers. Um, we work very closely with them, not only on game day activations, but game day activations tend to trickle over into this digital space. So. Yes, we end up using the app um, to, drive, to drive awareness of promotions or things that are, are sponsored. I think a good example of one that is a good one, um, and, and uh, candidly, we've probably, we haven't promoted it as much as we'd like to through the app, but um, things like uh, if the opponent misses two free throws at a game, you get Buffalo Wild Wings, or things that are game contingent um, with a sponsor tie. I think those are good things to use through push because they can be instant, right? If the opponent does miss two free throws, within a few minutes, you know, depending on your strategy, within a few minutes, all folks in arena could receive a push that says, hey, because so-and-so missed two free throws, make sure you visit a Buffalo Wild Wings after the game. I think that's a perfect example of when it can work out. Um, yeah, I think you have to think about, though, does it cross the line, right? That's a good one where it does tie into the game, but if it's, you know, swing by, if you just get a push randomly at, 8.30 a.m. on a Tuesday that says, come into, you know, Joe's tire shop to get an oil change, you're probably crossing into that line of, well, wait a minute, this isn't necessarily what I signed up for when I downloaded the Rutgers Athletics Game Day app. So I think the way you, you, you attack that is you have a strategy, and it tends to, that strategy is kind of born out of your overall strategy with your corporate sponsorship team. Um, and that strategy for us is that anything we're going to push out from a sponsor standpoint, it has to add value either to the fan experience or to the customer. So as long as it checks those two boxes, I think we feel like we're in a good spot. It's when you get outside of that realm of, uh, you know, with the oil change example, where it starts to become a little cumbersome and, and probably not a push worth sending. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Josh and Blair, do you guys have anything to add uh, to those comments there? Um, I think utilizing 
sponsor stuff is huge. Uh, I think it goes back to what your kind of what your purpose is and what your goal is. And for us as a smaller institution, we oftentimes have to incentivize students and fans to come out to our games consistently. Um, so if we have the opportunity to utilize um, a sponsored notification, um, we try to take advantage of that uh, as much as possible. Obviously, we don't want to overwhelm people that are on the app. And, you know, you talk about crossing that line and um, maybe utilizing that too much. But um, I think we've done a good job of using them at the appropriate times um, to try to incentivize people to come out to games for sure. One of the challenges that we face as a a small university in a major metropolitan area is finding corporate sponsors that are going to um, find a lot of value out of stuff like this. Um, however, um, we've had a few that have approached us since we've started using the app that um, I think are interested in finding ways that they can be a part of that. And um, it's really important that we're mindful of um, kind of like John said in his question, not crossing the authenticity line but still providing value to our users and customers when they're coming to games. Great. Thank you, guys. I'm going to pass this back over to Riley, and he'll have some closing remarks for us. Thanks, Sydney. And a uh, big thank you uh, to our panelists today from uh, Rutgers and uh, Concordia St. Paul as well for helping us out, uh, putting this together, uh, as well as uh, a thank you to everybody who made the time for us today. Uh, I know we're, we're slightly over on our, our time, so I'll, I'll be brief. I uh, just wanted to, to say, you know, uh, up on the screen here, we've got some of the different ways that you can reach us. Uh, so if you, um, you know, want to know more about what's going on with our company, certainly visit our website. If you want, if you have some questions about uh, something specific you're trying to do and you're on your FanX platform, uh, you can uh, uh, always visit our, uh, our new uh, help center, the FanX Success Center. I've uh, got that URL up here. And then, you know, we'd love for you to obviously uh, follow us on our, our social channels. Um, and one new thing we're going to start doing uh, here over, over the next few weeks and into uh, the spring is, uh, you know, we want to feature how you guys are using the app. Uh, you saw some examples today on, on the webinar. Uh, we think those are great. We know there's uh, uh, much, much more that you guys are all doing. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, so if you want us to, to feature you, you know, maybe in just a social post or, you know, on our blog or maybe on our next webinar, uh, feel free to, to tweet or post or uh, send us a, a DM or an email uh, with a screenshot of something you're doing in your app, um, whether it's a promotion, a notification, or fan guide or something else. Uh, use the hashtag FanX feature and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll share what you guys are doing and, and look forward to, uh, to seeing some of the creative things that, that you guys have in store. Um, so again, uh, thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, and we will be uh, sharing some more information in the coming weeks about our upcoming webinar series uh, that we'll be launching here in January of uh, 19. So thanks again uh, from, from now on, and uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.